Welcome back to another episode of the Todd Durkin Impact Show. This is Todd Durkin, and this is going to rock your world today. Folks, I have a great friend. His name is Kerry Minshew on the show today. And one of the reasons why I asked him to come on the show is because... Kerry is a longtime police officer. You talk about a great cop. This is the man who's made significant impact in not only San Diego, but nationwide and some of the initiatives he's got going on. And, you know, one of the things you've heard about over the last year or so is just, you know, in, in law enforcement and police officers, how many, quote, bad cops there are. Well, this is a great cop. He ain't even a good cop. He's a great cop. And there are a lot of great cops out there. Can I get an amen to all the great cops, all the the great law enforcement officers, firefighters, military, first responders? There are so many great people doing great things, and I want to highlight them. And Kerry Mansure is one of those guys. As a matter of fact, in today's episode, he's going to share some really personal uh experiences that he's had as a cop where he saved so many lives Um, and he shares his heart and soul when i say the heart and soul of a great cop you're gonna feel it so without further ado let's go out to my good friend kerry mensure welcome back to another episode of the todd durkin impact show and i am at Fitness Quest 10 today. I am in the office and I am so excited. I've got my great friend, Carrie Mansure in the house. Carrie, what's going on? Ooh, I am pumped to be here. Oh, Esther. this is going to be awesome. So check this out. I am at Fitness Quest 10 lower facility and today we're going to get better. And before we do that, uh, we're going to serve you. We're going to help you today. I can see you out there right now. You're fired up. Your booties are back. You're sitting up straight and uh, you've already got your workout in. Or you're working out right now. So keep up the great work. We're going to inspire you for the next 30, 40 minutes uh, today. I want to first say thank you. Thank you for the amazing feedback that you've been given the TD Impact Show. I mean, I'm talking people from all around the globe have been commenting that they've been listening while working out, while walking the dog, on the bus, on the train, on the plane. Yes, I said on the plane. People are traveling again. This is a good thing. So thank you for all your great words, your endorsements, all of your five-star reviews on iTunes, all the endorsements. You guys rock and roll. Thank you for the comments. Keep them coming because I read every single one of them. So, Kerry, are you ready to deliver the goods? Absolutely. I had my workout at 6 a.m. class like I do every Monday through Friday. You work out five days a week, 6 a.m. Six days a week. Six days a week. Five of them at 6 a.m. And then boot camp on Saturday, rain or shine. And, and sometimes you have been known to do double days. Uh, we, Diane and I have done a lot of double days <laughs> yeah. and sometimes triple days. So, guys, Carrie Mansure and his wife, Diane, are members and great clients at Fitness Quest 10. As a matter of fact, wait till you hear some amazing things they've done for our entire community coming up. But first, I want to give you the formal the formal background of Carrie Mansure. Uh, he's a 30-year I said 30-year law enforcement veteran, and uh, he's the consummate first responder. And this is a great topic today because we talk about first responders, you know, police officers, firefighters, physicians, nurses, first responders, period. Uh, Kerry spent nine years in the Navy. Uh, The Navy Submarine Service is a former firefighter. He's a current EMT, and he just recently retired as a police sergeant of San Diego PD, SDPD, which I have a story for, and y'all are going to like this one, but as the founder of Tomorrow's Police Officer, check that out, tomorrowspoliceofficer.com, he helps people to get hired as law enforcement officers and helps current law enforcement officers learn critical communication and tactical skills in the area of conflict resolution and de-escalation. What a great topic today. An international speaker, a best-selling author, and a highly sought-after communication mastery trainer, the man, the myth, the legend, Kerry Mansure, who's also known as a ninja communication uh, expert. He's here, easy to remember, even easier to implement. Kerry Mansure is in the house. Kerry, welcome. So glad to be here, Todd. Man. I, it, I've just uh, I listened to your podcast on a regular basis. I'm one of the people that's on a plane, on a, on the road, listening to episode after episode, catching up on the back stuff that I that 
that I missed along the way, and I absolutely oh, love you. it, man. You provide yeah. so much value, and you, you make people's lives better. You want to talk about having an impact. That's, this podcast has an that's impact. That's the purpose of the show, so thank you. You know, I want to talk about impact because uh, before we go into your illustrious career in law enforcement, I want to talk about you know the craziness that's going on sometimes in the world, even in law enforcement. I want to talk about your day-to-day you did something here in December of 2020, just uh, about two months ago, where we have scholarships that we give uh, to our staff. Folks, uh, the last, well, nine years, we have the Donna Dickinson Scholarship, then we added the Aurora Scholarship, and this goes to our team members who are doing an amazing job. And in 2020, uh, with the pandemic going on, there were some Herculean efforts. So Carrie and Diane come to me and they say, hey, Todd, We'd like to to do something called the Force for Good Scholarships, and we'd like to offer $2,000 in scholarships. I'm like, wow, wow, oh, wow. Can you talk about your vision and what the heck is the Force for Good Scholarships, and why did you guys do this? So Diane Halfman has a podcast show called Live Your Spa Life, and she had settled on the theme for 2021 for her show being force for good. Mm. So every guest that she has on her podcast, it's all about that. And as we were talking about how could we support you, how how could we support the people, because Fitness Quest 10 is family to us. Mm. We we get so much from working out here. It's it's, it's on every level. It's not just a physical level. Mm. It's the mental, it's the emotional, it's the spiritual. The community that you've built here is amazing and people gravitate to you uh, and they, they all have great hearts. So we wanted to be able to help support the staff that supports us every single time we're working. And we're here mm. six days a week. Mm. So that's why it just went along great with Diane's theme for her Live Your Spa Life show for Force for Good. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Your people were so amazing. When we read the scholarship applications, mm-hmm. we had settled on is like, okay, we can we can do two thousand. Right. We we and we budgeted for that. And literally we're sitting around the dinner table and we're we each have our own set of applications uh that we're going through and, and I, I just looked at Diane and she's looking at me and I said, I know what you're thinking, babe. And she goes, yeah, we got to give out two of these, not just one. Mm. So we upped it to $2,500 because your candidates, we couldn't decide between them. Mm-hmm. They were amazing applications because mm-hmm. you, you got amazing people here. You have you have done a great job in hiring people and training them and grooming them and inspiring them. And they turn around and they do that for our community. Well, what's cool about it is if you remember correctly, the Force for Good Scholarships, several of them – you voted on, but the other ones the team voted on. And I thought yeah. that was really cool. So Lisa Ivanovich and Kira Dusenberry both received $250 in scholarships because their teammates voted uh, for them to win because they were serving our community so valiantly uh, throughout the pandemic. And then Ryan Rogers um, and Jesse Dietrich and Kira Dusenberry, they won, again, additional scholarship money totaling $2,500. So huge thank you and just gratitude for you and Diane uh, because that was that was certainly um, an amazing amazing uh, just thing that you guys did for us so thank I, you I, I appreciate the compliment and you know one thing you know as a business owner I wanted to be able to support you in not just your employees your team members being trained but also the the reason that we created the spirit and the soul awards where the team members voted on the yep. winners yep. was because we wanted internally for you uh, as a business to be able to recognize the employees that are stepping up on a regular basis and have that inspire their teammates the rest of the people here because that makes your business more successful as well and so business owner to business owner Amen. wanted to support well you i think that. that's huge across the country right now across the globe we got to support small business owners we've got to you know support small yeah. business owners your local restaurants retail shops gyms studios worldwide get out there and support the locals it's really important um before i move on um the live your spa life what does spa stand for? Because I hear sometimes live your spa life. You think the spa. Uh, what does spa stand for? Well, yeah, yeah, you would typically think yeah. like, oh, like massages right. and soft Tibetan bowl mm-hmm. music, ringing, <laughs> singing, ringing. Which I love, by music, the way. Which, yeah, it's very cool when you're getting a massage. Uh, spa life stands for seek, power, 
always mm. in, 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 in what you're doing. And it's where harmony is, is, is along with success. Yeah. Give that a follow, guys. If you love your podcast, I know you listen to this show and you're looking for more inspirational podcasts, uh, Live Your Spa Life, Diane Halfman. You're going to want to follow that, listen to that. Between the Impact Show and Live Your Spa Life, you're going to have a lot of inspiration in your head. So, uh, you know, you're, you're listening to Kerry. You're like, oh, what a good guy. He's so nice. They gave away 2,500 scholarships. Well, let me set the record straight right here. Let me set it straight. He's not always a nice guy because <laughs> a couple years ago, okay, he's a, he's a police officer, and every year by tradition, the NFL players, I typically have them on my birthday, March 21st, and um, they always kind of try to spoof on me on my birthday. So two years ago, we're in the middle of a session with the NFL guys, and it's a full session. And um, I always know there's going to be something kind of cray-cray, sometimes, you know, kind of foolish and, and dumb. But a few years ago, something happened to me where I got arrested on my birthday. Yeah, I, I, I got arrested on my birthday. I've never been arrested, but I was arrested on my birthday. Let me explain, my friends. So I'm training the NFL guys. Full bore. I'm on the green grass here at Fitness Quest 10. And all of a sudden, at the corner of my eye, I see two cop cars come flying into the parking lot of Fitness Quest 10. And I'm, I'm like, huh, great, this is going to be funny. You know, these guys had the cops kind of come up. But when the cops came out of the car, they came out of the car like there was serious business going on. Like something happened and I didn't recognize them. So it wasn't Kerry popping out of the car. It wasn't another cop that I know. And I know a lot of cops in town. I didn't recognize these guys. They come in Fitness Quest 10. They go to the front desk and say, uh, is there a Mr. Todd Durkin here? I'm like, this is funny, guys, really funny. Well, I, they point them to me, and all of a sudden the NFL players, I could tell they weren't up to this and they had no idea what was going on. The police officers come up to me and then they start asking me some very, very personal questions <laughs> about some of my habits. And I said, no, I think you're, you're mistaken. That No, they, these, are, these are allegations that are absolutely not true. And I've got to kind of chuckle because it's my birthday. And, you know, and they, weren't, they weren't laughing around. They weren't joking. They were serious. And as I'm talking to them, these guys are serious. I'm looking around as now three cop cars are around. There's multiple cops. And I'm like, we've got a problem on my hand. There's, there's clients and members who are looking at me like I'm a criminal and I don't recognize these cops. I'm like, can someone please help me? Because I'm not about to go to jail for Business Quest 10. Lo and behold, they start reading me the, 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 the riot act about how I'm going to be arrested. And I'm looking around. My, my NFL guys are like, TD, we can't help you. We don't know what's going on. And then... Out of the corner of my eye, I look through the back door and I see these this this face with a little chuckle on his face with two eyes, an Irish looking grin, and it was this just a, I won't even say what kind of grin it was, but it was a little she grin, and uh, it was Kerry Mansour had the San Diego Police Department come and almost arrest me here at Fitness Quest Ten. So Kerry, I haven't forgiven you since then, brother. You know what? It, 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 the look on your face was awesome as you were trying to talk your way out of it and realizing you weren't going to talk your way out of this one. Yeah. You were going downtown. I, I had never been arrested. That was as close as it's come to being arrested. And it went from laughing to all of a sudden the pit of my stomach said, how am I going to explain to Melanie that <laughs> getting arrested <laughs> in the middle of my gym for something that I didn't even do? So, uh, yeah, now you even like care even more because he's a practical joker. And uh, I still owe him one, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But, but Kerry, that was darn, darn good. So tell me about this. You've been a, you know, a cop for 30-plus years, um, an illustrious career. You're just recently retired. Just step back for a second. Why did you even get into law enforcement in the first place? Y you know, I wasn't going to be a cop. I, you know, every every kid grows up thinking you know, I'd be a cop, be a firefighter. Well, my dad mm. had been a fire chief. My dad was on the fire on, on a couple different fire departments back in Michigan where I grew up. So I grew up at the firehouse. And so when when I was in South Carolina, I joined the fire department out there. I was, I was a firefighter out there. And then when I moved out to California, I was a firefighter here in San Diego. So for, for about four and a half years, I was in the fire world. I had no intention of being in law enforcement. Hold on a second. What, what part of Michigan did you grow up? Uh, uh, midway between Ann Arbor and Detroit. Okay. And what brought you from there to South Carolina? Uh, well, I was assigned my first uh, submarine. 
uh, first of two submarines in South Carolina. In, uh, yeah, Charleston, South Carolina okay, is Charleston, where my base is. South, yeah. There's a sub base in South Carolina. There is right, right. on the coast, and okay. then uh, Kings Bay, Georgia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we used to travel down there for refits, and so I did eight deployments while I was in the Navy, and then so you'd go underwater for like how long? Oh, uh, seventy-two days straight would not be Stop. uncommon. Stop. Yeah. So like no sunshine for seventy-two days. If you can imagine, did you, you work know, out? Uh, we did. We had a treadmill, and, and you know, at certain times you can, certain times you can't, because if you're, you, you can't be detected. You can't be like dropping weights on the floor. It's <laughs> yeah. not. It's Somebody's not that going kind of down. Environment. Yeah. Right. And is it true? I've heard this that submarines, the the, the submarine, uh, anyone that's in a submarine, the food is the best in submarines versus any any military branch. Is that true? Like in the Navy submarines? Absolutely. Absolutely, it is. And it, what was even better is. Uh, the the guy who was in charge, like the chief chef, he wanted to win this special award year after year. He had won it before on other boats. And so when he came to ours, he was like bound and determined to keep his record up. Well, part of that award is the crew survey. So he had to keep the crew happy, which was amazing. So that's kind of oxymoron. You put people underwater for 72 days. You send the best chefs to the submarines, feed them as much food as you can. Don't let them exercise, except you probably have yeah. a few treadmills. So yeah. are most people in the submarines, are they overweight, mm. out of shape, not healthy? You know, the first the first two patrols that I did, we smoked. I didn't, but people smoked on the submarine. Oh. Now, if you can imagine this, it's, in, it's a contained environment. Oh. We're recirculating the oh. air. Oh. And so every Friday, we would have what was called field day, which was okay. cleanup. Yep. And everybody on the boat was awake for that. And we'd, for about four hours, we'd clean the submarine. And um, in the lounge area, I very distinctly wow. remember taking a sponge and cleaning you know, like a pine saw type kind of thing, cleaning the walls and this yellow gunk from the cigarette smoke coming off the walls. And I'm thinking, well, you can't do that now, right? No, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, good, yeah, they good, stopped good. that, thankfully. So thank you for your service. You Thanks. end up moving to San Diego or to California? Ult- ultimately ended up in San Diego. Okay. And uh, I was an electronics instructor out here, which is uh, – kind of continued my, the training that I had started on the submarine. So I've been an instructor for, a, a trainer for over 36 years now mm. and got uh, got in the training community heavily yep. while I was an electronics instructor in the Navy. Okay, I was also at the same time on the fire department because the, the cool thing about shore duty is the hours are short mm. and so it left me plenty of time for the fire department. And during that time, again, I had no interest in becoming a cop. And then hmm. I did one fateful thing. I went on a ride along. How old were you? I was, when I went on a ride along, I was probably 24, 25 years old. And I went on this ride along no. and all of a sudden I realized I didn't have to wait at the station for a medical aid call or a fire to happen or a traffic accident. I could go out and do my own thing at my and own find pace <laughs> and, yeah and be proactive because mm. firefighting is it's all reactive the only proactive stuff you really do is is community relations and, and, and inspections and things like that but you're not you know you're waiting for the community to summon you mm. whereas in law enforcement you're proactive and you're going out and you're making a difference literally as as much as you can so you're 24 25 and you just had that point i want to be a cop yeah so by the time i applied went through the background investigation, the hiring process, which is, it's it's hard. It's a, it's in a very arduous process. In fact, getting hired as a cop, other than becoming a SEAL or Delta Force or Green Beret in the military, getting hired as a cop is the most arduous hiring mm. process there is. And it, it's incredibly expansive. Would you say more so today because of the, the economic climate or the, the political climate or harder today? or the same today as it was 20, 30 years ago? No, it's it's definitely the same. I think it's, if anything, it is a little bit harder. And here's, here's the difference. People who are looking to go into law enforcement mm-hmm. have a host of temptations for behavior that can end your career before yeah. it begins than I did. You know, I grew up in, in a rural part of Michigan. I, it never occurred to me, there wasn't even, I'm sure there's probably some marijuana around somewhere, but it never occurred to me 
to smoke, and I would have I would have declined it. And then I got in the Navy, and they were doing your analysis testing, and so it was a you know a big no no then. So those temptations to me weren't there. Right. But nowadays with recreational marijuana being okay, that can be something that can keep you from getting hired. Mm. And so making those decisions about what you want to do for the long term. Yeah. I want to talk about that later. I want to talk about later in the show, if there's someone who is considering that, some things to do and not do. I think it's it's interesting. And not everyone obviously listening today um, wants to be a cop or is a cop. But I can guarantee you this, everyone who's listening right now can learn some of the lessons that Carrie has learned from being a cop for 30 plus years uh, and as a first responder as well. Um, Speaking of which, with a 30 plus year career in law enforcement, there's obviously lots of experiences you had, lots of lessons learned. If there are two or three lessons that would be applicable for anyone, any of our mind right maniacs, any of our fire breathing dragons of like what you learned as a cop that can be that can be taken for any of us what would be a couple of those lessons you know i think the one of the top three or five is understanding that there's a perspective Mm. and you have just one piece of that Mm -hmm. and the ability to look through someone else's lens the ability to understand what their perspective is is so powerful you know i always used to say that if you if you interview a victim, witness, suspect, doesn't matter, and you and then interview the other people involved, there's going to be their side, like the suspect side, the victim side, and then the truth about what really happened. Mm. There, because some, and that's somewhere in the middle usually, yeah. because everybody has their perspective about what happened. You can think about this, you know, if you're at home with your kids, and and you have a disagreement with your children. They have a perspective, and if you if you ask them to tell you what happened, you might go, uh, "What planet were you yeah, on?" That's because what I would say. They're I the, wasn't, that's the wrong perspective they have. It, of course, it's the wrong perspective. <laughs> of course, your kids. Right, of course. parents. Can I, I get an amen? Yeah. <laughs> so the the biggest thing is being able to take a step back and go, mm-hmm. "Okay, what might I be missing mm-hmm. in this? Mm-hmm. Where 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 might my blind spot be? Mm. Because when you can do that, when you can recognize where the other person is coming from, that doesn't mean you have to agree with them. It doesn't mean that they are right. What it means is you understand wh- what they're feeling, that they're feeling those things. And if you can understand why they're feeling those things, that's even better. But yep. just to understand that they're going through this experience, mm. just to to go, okay, I, I get that they're feeling that. I wouldn't feel that way. Yeah. You might be thinking that. Or you might be even going, okay, no, you know, I missed that. I get it now. Mm-hmm. It, it it you don't have to validate and say that they're right to understand that they're going through something. Right. And right. and that's that that cognitive empathy. Yeah is is so critical to be able to communicate truly with someone. I've recognized that you are a great listener. Do you think that's a skill or lesson that you've learned in all your experiences from being a cop? Tell me more. Because whenever I hear, I, I've watched you, you were at a retreat in Nashville, when you're, when you're listening to people, you really listen attentively, and it seems like when someone's talking, you're not thinking about the response to what I'm going to say right now, you're listening to my words, and I've noticed this about you in the couple years I've known you, several years I've known you, is... You're very empathetic when you're listening, and you listen with your eyes, your ears, not just your ears. And I wonder if that's from your years of, you talk about conflict resolution, someone's, you know, whether someone just committed a crime or someone's drunk or they got in a fight, um, you obviously, I, I've noticed you're very calm in stressful situations. Is that something that you feel that is, is this who, you're part of your DNA, or is that a lesson that you've learned along the way, or both? It's probably a mix, and I want to. I want to stop. I want to hit the pause button for just a moment because I did something with you. And and if you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> back up about one minute. Hit Am that I being interrogated second. right now? Almost. <laughs> so hit hit that back button a little bit to when Todd asked the first question, and I replied, "Tell me more." Mm. I could have answered your question, but when I said, "Tell me more," you gave me so much more. Mm. So being able to sit back and be patient. Most people, there's, there's a guy by the name of Dr. George Thompson. He invented something called verbal judo. And 
th- I was trained on this as a young cop, and, and verbal judo takes you to a certain point. Unfortunately, it has its limits, and that's why I developed the training that I did, which was to continue on. I call my stuff verbal judo on steroids. Love it. But what with verbal judo, Dr. George Thompson said this amazing quote that I will never forget. It was, when people are in a conversation, you're either talking or listening. Most people would say that. But in reality, you're either talking or waiting to talk. Mm. That's, that's, that's the shift that Dr. Thompson had. And when I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. How many times are you listening to someone? You're hearing them more than listening because hearing is a, a noun, listening is a verb. Right. And so to listen to someone takes effort. You can hear somebody, but you're not necessarily taking in what they're saying. When you listen to somebody, you're listening for key words. You're listening for where their perspective is. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that you can do that, one of my little tricks that I teach in training is that simple phrase, tell me more. Mm. And when you do that, the person will almost give you more information. Now, you asked, am I being interrogated? (laughs) Well, what is amazing to me is the number of times that I was able to get a suspect to make a confession, make an admission when I would never have thought that they would. Mm -hmm. And the key to it was, was being patient and letting them talk Mm -hmm. rather than accusing them, making them, making them bad for the city, listening without judgment. Right. And, and, and and parents, parents, especially when I say you have to do this, I mean, you have to do this with your kids. You have to do this with your cohabitants, the people that step across the threshold of your door you have to be able to listen without judgment otherwise Mm. if you're judging and people can see it on your face like that they can they see they see that flash in your eyes they see the the downturn of your head they 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 watch the eyebrows gather together (laughs) and they they see the wtf forming in the thought bubble above your head by the way that stands for wow that's fun (laughs) and or what the focus. Or what the focus, yes. If you don't listen without judgment, then that person will stop talking to you. Mm-hmm. They will not open up to you. And who do you want to have open up to you more than anyone in this entire world? Your kids. Now, if you don't have kids, or your kids, kids, you already have that great relationship, then it's the people that you're closest to. You want them to open up to you, which means... You have to be able to consider their perspective, which is listening without judgment. So when, all right, here we go. So when Diane, let's say she just every now and then gets on your nerves. I know she doesn't, but let's oh. just say, she, oh. let's just say she does. And you want to, as her loving mm-hmm. husband, you just want to just get bark back at her. So how does Carrie the cop deal with this from a relationship standpoint so that you don't just retort back something that's going to bite you in the backside and come back and put you in the doghouse forever well <laughs> I, I, and i'm going to say that i i am human mm. and i am not perfect yeah. i don't want to be perfect because the the last guy that was like totally perfect <laughs> you look how it worked out for him <laughs> so um no i i'm not perfect however i will say this I, I, I literally have, I work hard at that. Mm. I concentrate on that. And I developed an acronym called SALT. Mm. And it's because it's easy to remember the SALT. And the first thing that I'll do is the S in SALT stands for stop. So this is almost like conflict resolution. This is conflict resolution. Okay. Yeah, it's completely Doesn't conflict. matter if it's a spouse, a, a family member, s- someone that you, if you're in a law enforcement, if you're dealing with a suspect, Anything in con- as an entrepreneur with an employee, the SALT acronym yeah. is conflict resolution. Absolutely. And, and the cool thing is it's these are transferable skills. So okay. what you get to do is you get to take 30 years plus all of the research that I've done, plus all of the cops that I've talked mm-hmm. to about this. You get to take all of these skills that cops use on a regular basis out on the street and use them if you're a business owner. Mm-hmm. Use them if you're a parent. Use them when you're in a relationship because they're transferable skills. They, they, you don't have to be a cop to use this stuff. 
Hmm. They work for everybody because we're all trying, hopefully, to be better people. We're all looking for, okay, what's going to make my relationship better? Hmm. Uh, how can I be happier in life? Mm-hmm. And this is one way. Mm-hmm. So the the first thing that you do is you recognize that my, I'm getting hijacked here. I'm hmm. starting to get upset. Hmm. I'm starting to, you know, it's it's called the amygdala hijack. So the amygdala, the, the emotional center of your brain, mm-hmm. it's starting to take over. It's dropping you into the fight or flight uh, state, the, 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 the response. And, and here's the thing, just real briefly, your brain, your brain can only be in one of two places, one of two states. It can be in an executive state or it can be in a survival state. That's it. It's one or the other. Now, when you're in your executive state, you're using your prefrontal cortex. You're using the front of your brain. You're stuff. making well-reasoned decisions. This is where you're, you're creative. You can improvise, adapt, and overcome. You can shift on a dime. You can, you can yeah, this great productivity, this great focus. When you're in the survival state, which unfortunately – about 70% of the time we're in survival state. And think about this. What, what has your brain been in for the last year mm. since all the shutdown stuff happened, since your lives changed dramatically? That's right. That's right. So people are in that survival state even more today than they were February of 2020. Mm-hmm. Now, when you're in survival state, you don't, you don't think as well. You don't perform as well. You don't have the same focus, right? So you want to shift back when you can to that hmm. executive state. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the first ways that you do that, one of the and there's a couple different ways. You know, you know, at different times, different tools work. You know, in my in my toolbox, if all I have in my toolbox is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. That's right. So this is one tool. One tool is salt. So Love stop. It. Stop. Pause. And, and it's, it's something called a pattern interrupt. It's a pattern interrupt for you. It's a pattern interrupt for the person that you're in conversation with. Mm-hmm. So because you've paused, the other person is like, what's going on? Now, they might, can, they might be so wrapped up. They might be so triggered. They might be so in their survival state that they just keep on talking. That's okay. Because now we go into AL, which is actively listen now active listening that it, again it's a verb you 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 mentioned some things and everybody can hit that 15 second 30 second back button and go back to what you said but you said i listen with my eyes i listen with my facial expressions i listen with my body language see i can talk to you i'm not saying any words and and it's a simple uh, i call it the golden retriever head tilt i like that the golden retriever head tilt. You ever well. seen a dog just look at you and go? Jersey mm-hmm. does it every day to me. Yeah, he does it every day. Right, and it. What's interesting is you engage with your dog when they give you that head tilt. Mm-hmm. You almost cannot. <laughs> it's so true. Right. So as a human, you give them the golden. I call it the golden retriever head tilt. Now, your 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 eyebrows move. Your you you nod your head. Your, you you have that look of oh. You have that look on your face of hmm. Let me, I'm thinking about what you're just saying. Mm-hmm. Don't have the look on your face of your eyebrows furrowed together and, and you're getting angry because then you're waiting to talk. Yeah. Now, the, then the, the T. What's the L? The, the L's the act of listening. That's the got AL. It. Okay, so got it, got stop, it. Got pause. It. To, I also call it the power of the pause. Got it. That's the pattern interrupt. Yep. Now, if that doesn't work and the person just keeps talking, then actively listen. And, and at some point, you're going to be in dialogue with the person, so actively listen at that point. And then take responsibility. So, mm. Diane, uh, I, I, do, I do dumb things all the time. I'm, I'm like the king of dumb things. No. And KDT, that should be my nickname, king of dumb things. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do something, and she'll say, hey, you know, this, this happened. And I'll look at her and I'll go, uh, let me let me think of an example. Um, we have these dishes. They're salad mass or uh, cook, cookware, salad master cookware. It's mm-hmm. high-end cookware. Okay. I love this stuff. Well, if you don't dry the lid, it, it gets water spots on it. Right. Now, honestly, she does not get on me about this, which is really cool. But let's say, let's use this as an example. Carrie, you didn't dry the lid. It got water spots on it. And if she happens, and Diane's an amazing woman she does not use always and never but sometimes those words slip into your vocabulary mm-hmm. the, the 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 
There's no room for you anything always else. Do that. Always do this. You never do this. Right. And and so if that were the case, let's say she said you you always forget to dry the lid. Mm-hmm. What I would say to her is, you know what? Yeah, sometimes I do forget to dry the lid mm. because I'm taking responsibility for my act. Did I forget it this time? Yes. Do I always forget it? No. Mm-hmm. Yet I do do it. So I own. I take responsibility for my actions, which is yes, yep. yes, sometimes I forget to dry the lid mm. because that takes all of the negative energy away. Salt. That's good. Now, That's good. I, if, if I turn around and I say to her, well, honey, you forget to dry the lid too. Well, we're going nowhere, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and the reality is if she's calling me on dry, not drying the lid, she's calling me on leaving the the cap off the toothpaste the argument's not about that Mm -hmm. and what if if i want to be in relationship with her i've got two choices i can be right or i can get it right Mm. if i just want to be right i didn't leave the tube the the cap off you must have or 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 johnny did or or the dog chewed it off yep but if i want to get it right if i want to get my relationship right if i want to get my communication right mm-hmm. that requires me to take some responsibility for my actions you know it's interesting while you talk about this i want to liken it because you're using the relationship analogy to business and entrepreneurism because when you talk about salt and you said stop pause and you know, stop and pause and have a pattern interrupt. I think about like the last year, everyone's been busy, busy, mm-hmm. reacting, quote, pivoting. And I feel a lot of it is we've been busy being busy because the busyness is such a disease. It's such a, you get addicted to the feeling of busyness. And one of the best things we could do is actually slow down or stop, pause and say, am I creating something that actually is in line with my purpose or in line with what I'm trying to create? And the active listening part, actively listen is, are you seeking out the mentors? Are you seeking out people who are in your circle of influence who can give you feedback to say, no, 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 you're spending your time on something that's wasting your time. Like, I mean, when I'm thinking conflict resolution is, your conflict resolution is maybe your business or your career isn't going the way you want it to. And you're saying it's the pandemic, it's COVID-19, all of that, which may be true. But truthfully, you could also be just being busy and you're focusing on the wrong things. And the taken responsibility to your point, Carrie, is this. As a leader for 20-something years in my businesses, is it's so easy to point fingers at the employees aren't doing their job. They don't care like I care. They're not as hardworking. They're not willing to work seven days a week. No fake. They're, they're, many of them aren't. That, maybe that's my responsibility as a leader to say, how can I empower and impart wisdom, vision, mission in them so that they can see growth opportunities, that they could, that I could listen to what they want for their life and I can help them create that if it is in alignment with our core values and our mission as well. So I liken your, your conflict resolution of salt, not only to relationships, but in the business or career world, if you're not happy with your career, you're not, you're not achieving what you want. Perhaps you use that acronym, you stop, you pause, you have a pattern interrupt, you seek out other mentors or people in your life who understand your industry, and then you take responsibility and say, you know what, this is on me. i got to improve my habits and start working out again. Huh? How does working out have to do with my career success? Are you kidding? If you've been listening to this podcast for 150-something episodes or whatever we're at now, is like, like you've got to be dialing into your habits and that does impact and affect everything in your life. So, man, salt. I like salty. We've got to add a Y. Like, let's be salty. What's the why? Say yes. <laughs> Take responsibility for yourself. Yourself. There you go. There you go. Salty. All right. And, and you know what? I, I learned this. Obviously, shooting skills in law enforcement is a big deal. We go to the range on a regular mm. basis. And, and uh, one of the blessings that I had, I had a Navy SEAL teaching me how to shoot. And... But they were, you know, he's teaching me this different techniques than the normal law enforcement instructor had. And he said something one day, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is brilliant. He said, slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. What? Yeah. I use that in the conditioning world. Perfect. It's this, it's, it, it works. 
it works. And you know, I got to tell you, your book, Get Your Mind Right, Mm. taught me so many valuable things. But one of them is the importance of working out. And I want to share one other thing. It's not my phrase. It's somebody else's. I, I, I don't know who it's attributed to. But they said, the easy stuff is hard and the hard stuff is easy. Mm-hmm. So the easy stuff, sitting on the couch, binging out on Netflix, ordering in pizza, uh, drinking beer, having red wine every night, that's easy. Mm-hmm. It's hard later when you suffer those health right. problems. The hard stuff is easy. Getting up at 4.30, quarter to five in the morning to journal, to mm. meditate, mm. to read the Bible, and then get to 6 a.m. class. Mm. That's hard. Mm-hmm. But I've dropped weight. I've dropped body fat. I've dropped visceral fat. And I practice your three, two, one, three hours before bed, no eating, two hours, no work, one hour, no electronics. Mm-hmm. My sleep is better. I get more sleep now today than I than I did before I read your book. Mm. Your book had, you want to talk about impact, it had impact. And what that, that, that ripple effect. Mm. Now I'm able to help more people. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the, 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 the pandemic ultimately is not the problem. The problem is our focus shifts mm. because now we are in a survival state instead of Amen. an executive state. I love it. I love it. I want to shift here some final questions, specifically about being a cop. And this, I think people are going to enjoy this because I've always been intrigued by being a cop. You didn't know this, but I actually consider once being a New Jersey State Trooper. I was I oh, was wow. coaching back in Jersey. This is before I came out here, and a friend of mine was a state trooper. You know, you got the trooper hats, and you're and he's like, "Listen, TD, you you, you could be a Jersey State Trooper." And I was like thinking the Meadowlands. You got the troopers there, and I ended up in, I didn't end up doing that because I went and played football. But there's a lot of different hats you can wear in law enforcement, and from detective, undercover, SWAT. All these, you know, all these different roles. If there was one role out of all of them that was your favorite, which one was it? Oh my gosh! Um, well, I, I did a lot of those things. Um, I was an undercover detective. I was a detective for fourteen years. Mm. I worked undercover, uh, several different undercover assignments, and uh, in fact, one of them uh, was working with diane at the time we weren't dating at the time we just we knew each other through work and she was an undercover prostitute we were hunting a serial killer what so those were cool times but you know i gotta tell you my favorite i want to hear this my favorite assignment my favorite assignment bar none because it was just it was all the fun and no very very little paperwork which is unusual in law enforcement i was a tactical flight officer in the helicopter for about a year and a half interesting and so uh Abel's the San Diego PD helicopters, and we, we had four helicopters, and we, you know, flew in all four of them. Is before we got the new ones. They were old helicopters too, no air conditioning. I mean, it was it was it was grunt work. But you know, we landed one night on on, on a, in a community park. God, I'm gonna get choked up. I was in, there was a eight year old who'd been shot in the face during the. Uh, during a drive-by shooting Mm. and Mm. we landed under the worst possible conditions the wind was wrong the lighting was wrong there was fencing around the the park and we landed and i jetted out of the helicopter paramedic was there and he handed her to me over the fence i took her he grabbed his gear. He jumped over the fence. I ran her to the helicopter, put her in the back. And we lifted off. I swear we were on the ground for, I don't think, more than 45 seconds. I mean, it mm. was a hit and run. Mm. And I was on two different radios, talking to the dispatcher, doing a medical report, talking to the medic in the back who's giving me more information, and we're headed for Children's Hospital. And there's a life flight helicopter. They weren't available. Mm on the landing pad at children's so my pilot is talking to the helicopter pilot for life light and he's like get out of there now mm. they do an emergency lift off they peel off we come in 
And the trauma surgeon told us later that the only reason she lived. Hmm. Was because of what we did. Hmm. So I look at it this way. Over 30 years, um, I have saved more lives than I've taken. <laughs> hmm. And uh, that's a pretty good balance to have after a 30-year career. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Sorry, I got emotional about that. You don't need to ever apologize. Didn't think I would. You never need to Didn't apologize for that because here's the thing. A lot of times, especially nowadays, cops get bad raps get bad raps and you can see in your heart right now the reason why you got into this in 30 years of career is to save people right and i appreciate you sharing that story and i love hearing that that yeah. girl lived because of your headiness your preparation all that work that you did going back from michigan down to you know your time in the navy and into what you did as a police officer um why why is it now in a time where our, I'll just say our country needs great cops. Mm -hmm. Cops get a bad rap, man. And I know a lot of cops, and they put their life on the line every day. They're always dealing with people at their worst. Um, you know, how do you, as a cop yourself, what's it all about? And 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 what makes a great cop? How do you how do you how do you attract more cops today? Like we need more great cops. And unfortunately, every time you, if you turn on the TV and watch the news, if you do that, I don't. But Cops are getting a bad rap, and we don't want to lose great cops because we need great cops. We don't need bad cops. The bad cops always get the headlines, and you know, obviously, in any profession, there's bad people. But we need more great cops. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and and I've always said that. Look, we're never going to have perfect cops. We hire from the human race, <laughs> right? Good point. We we, we we've got. Bad doctors, bad teachers, you know, there's there's Absolutely. always a percentage, but there it's such a small percentage. And when you think about it, you don't have to have a, a background investigation like a cop does to get hired. You know, and it they're carrying they're they're carrying the ability to take away someone's freedom. The very thing our country was founded on, a law enforcement officer can take away from you and take away your life. Mm. And and yes. The, the, the viral videos, those are hard, and, and the protests are hard. Right. We need great cops because of this. Mm. Through what's happened, and, and there's a variety of reasons why it happened, but there's the, the trust between the public and the police has been broken. Mm. It's been damaged. Mm. And in any relationship, if, if I break trust with Diane, I need to step up. And repair that it's not diane's responsibility to step i mean i would like her to help but it's not her responsibility to take that first step toward repairing that mm -hmm. and so we need great cops to be able to do that and the cops that are out there by and large 99.9 percent .9 of them are, are doing everything they can yep. they're showing up and uh, on when hmm. they under, under the worst of circumstances exactly and now i'm asking them to do one other thing and that's to follow the model of trust-based policing. Mm. Now, I, I am pushing trust-based policing, and it has one simple metric. When you have an encounter with a citizen, does that citizen, when you walk away, trust law enforcement more? Mm. And if you get somebody who hates cops or who doesn't like cops or who doesn't really trust law enforcement, are they going to turn 180 and all of a sudden be a raving fan? No, it's probably not because that's not human nature. However, can you move the needle a little bit? And, and if nothing else, have you done – the metric is this. Have you done everything that you can to lead that person trusting law enforcement just a little bit more? Mm. It doesn't have to be a lot. You say all the time, 1% better every day. Mm -hmm. So we need great cops to be able to do that, mm -hmm. and, and we have to do that. We, in, in order for our – society to function smoothly for people to feel safe in their communities we have to reestablish that trust just like if if a husband and wife have an agreement that they're going to be monogamous and and one of them is not and that trust is broken at a very large level it, it takes a lot of work to restore that trust mm. it's not easy it's not overnight and it takes effort but that's what we need. That's why we need great cops. Yeah. It seems like one of your initiatives, at least that I've seen and as I've known you last year, is you've almost gone on this crusade to attract new cops, men, young men and women who want 
to become police officers or are looking for a great career. And I've seen your efforts. You go live. You put out great emails, great content on the next wave of, of young police officers looking for a career that they can give back to the community. What, what's that initiative all about? Why are you so, now that you just retired, why are you so driven by your mission to get new cops into the force? Well, and, and I just want to clarify one thing. It's not just young people. Mm. It's not so young people. You know, there's not an age limit on mm. any other agency, local or state, uh, except Highway Patrol. Mm. California Highway Patrol has that. And, and some other states, but in California, uh, we've had people in their 60s come on and be cops. Really? Yes. And, and it, let's see, you know, people who are retiring after military career, they get yeah. out at 39, 40, 38 sometimes if they, they came in like I came in, I was 17 years old. That was a month after my I turned 17. Yeah, I was in the Navy. The years. I was so <laughs> wet. So wet. <laughs> but you're retiring at, at 37, 38, 39 wow. years old and you're looking for a second career. I help those people too. And yes, mm. I am on an absolute mission that great people can become great cops mm. and through the get hired academy which is on tomorrow's police officer.com that's your website that's the website tomorrow's police officer.com okay. you can go there and, and, and you can look at i want to be a cop and then what happens is i can help you through this really mm. complicated process and you know i've i've coached hundreds of people through the hiring process mm. and there's so many different success stories and there's there's been some people who I steered away from a career in law enforcement. Why? Because, Personality wasn't right? Yeah. See, there's two people, two two personalities that will never be a cop. The first one is I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna call a cowboy or like Maverick and Top Gun, <laughs> right? He couldn't follow the rules, right? He was just again doing right. tower flybys and all this other stuff. <laughs> and it drove everybody crazy. And, and you know, he's 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 the hero. Not in the a movie. team player. I get that. Right, and and we need team players in law enforcement. We we got to have, we 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 got to know. We got to be able to depend on you to be where you're supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. Now the other person is the the exact opposite. The 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 person who is so kind hearted that they they won't hurt any. Thing on this planet mm. and and god bless them I, mm. I i love that and and the world needs you and the world needs great teachers and great doctors and great carpenters and in mm. all these different occupations wonderful people who are great at the jobs but they'll never be a good cop mm. they'll never be a great cop because the reality is you have to be willing to use deadly force to be a police officer mm -hmm. that's the bare minimum mm -hmm. you have to be willing to do that not that you want to and it's 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 absolutely the last resort. Hmm. But if you can't pull that trigger, you can't be a cop. Hmm. I don't want you being a cop because you're putting everybody at danger, including you. Hmm. Now, what I can do is if you're thinking, well, I don't know if I could or couldn't, I can help you with that decision. I've had people that I steered away from law enforcement and then they're successful in their other careers. Right. And I've had people who are on the fence and I, I let them see as, as I coached them and, and mentored them that they have the capacity. They just didn't believe they had some self-limiting beliefs mm -hmm. going on. They didn't believe that they could be successful in a career that's as demanding yeah. as law enforcement. And, and make no mistake, law enforcement's demanding career. If, if you're not willing to, to work hard and be your best on a regular basis when you're feeling like you can't be your best, but you have to reach deep down inside. If you got that inside you, you probably have the makings of great cop. Right. You know, it's one thing I really love about the military, police officers, firefighters, is I think it, it has the ability for great men and women to really step up in their leadership. Meaning I think right now, the world needs some really strong leaders. And I believe the discipline that military, police, fire offers is the ability to step up in the ranks. There's great training for those men and women who want to, to move in that direction. And you can move up to become a chief, to become a sergeant, to become uh, in, in politics. As you get into politics, we need great leaders. So yeah. it's a great breeding ground for men and women, 
I'd say young, but anyone, right? Um, especially though, if you're in your 20s and 30s and you're looking for a career of like, I want to find a career that pays well, has got benefits, I can step up and be a difference maker in my community. I think it's an it's an amazing opportunity on that. Now, um, Carrie, thank you for what you do. First off, I, I I'm enjoying this conversation. If someone no, let's say someone listening wants more information with about you and what you do, or perhaps it's a son or daughter. I mean, I've got an 18 year old son going off to college, but not everyone's going to college, or maybe you are going to college and you still don't know what you want to do, or when you're just done with college or you just got out of the military, they want to maybe go in to be a police officer. Can you just share how the heck would someone follow you, learn more about you, the Tomorrow's Police Officer? Is it tomorrowspoliceofficer.com? Um, can you please share that of uh, any way that someone could follow more about, I want to be a cop or I am a cop and I want to follow Kerry Mentor? Because, folks, this is a guy with 30 plus years of experience. This is called a mentor. If, if you want to go into the military, you want to go into the, uh, law enforcement, you maybe want a, a career maybe someday in the FBI or CIA. The the military, being a police officer are all ways that you could potentially use to do that. Or you could be like Kerry, a 30-plus year law enforcement professional making an inc- impressive impact in your communities. Kerry, please share with someone how they can follow you, learn from you, and uh, anything else you want to share. I appreciate the compliments, Todd. And the the easiest way is to go to tomorrow's police officer.com. Okay. On that page, you can choose that if you want to become a police officer, mm-hmm. a little button that you click. You if you already are a law enforcement officer and you want additional training and resources, there's a button for you to click there and it's real easy to see. If you're a business owner and you want to learn some of these skills that cops use to develop rapport with your clients and your customers and to be able to communicate better and be able to increase revenues, there's a button for you there. And the very top of the page, very top of the page, you can click on the Facebook link or the YouTube. Whenever I go live, I go live on both of those platforms. There's tons of content. So you can go to facebook.com forward slash tomorrow's police officer. You can go to the YouTube channel for tomorrow's police officer. And there's tons of short little snackable videos that Mm -hmm. will answer a lot of questions. And I focus mainly on communication mastery. Mm. How are, are, are you going to get along in this world with other people? How are you going to communicate better? And I, a lot of this it involves personality science and neuroscience. It's stuff that nobody else is teaching mm. anywhere else. Hmm. Hmm. Folks, check that out. I'm going to put all of that in the show notes of this episode. So go check out the episode show notes, and I'll put all of the YouTube, Facebook, the tomorrowspoliceofficer.com. And even if you don't want to be a cop or you're not a cop, I highly suggest following Kerry because he puts out a lot of great inspirational material as well. This is one of the world's most foremost foremost experts when it comes to communication, conflict resolution, and for anyone that wants to get into the law enforcement field. So it's not just reserved for those of you who may want to be a cop. I want you to follow Kerry. He's one of the the great cops out there who really wants to make a difference in the world. And in today's day, you all know it as well as I do, we need more people out there that are positive contributors to society, people who are making a positive addition to our our communities. And Kerry, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your service in the military, for law enforcement, 30 plus years. You shared one story of a young eight-year-old whose life you saved, but I I bet there are thousands of people who you who you have positively helped through the good and through the bad um and today who are living because of an experience they had with you so i say thank you for your service everything you've done and uh i'm excited for you i'm excited for your future with how you're going to help more people become great great cops because we need more great police officers so thank you thank you, thank you. and you know i want to i want to leave you with a quote and, and I'm going to paraphrase it just a little bit. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Mm. And I, I, I read this quote in a, in a book one morning right before I went to work. And I was working swing shift. And it says, the, the quote from Emerson is, Every man I meet is better than me in some way. Mm. And that of him I learn. Everybody's got something that they're better at than you are. Mm-hmm. Some 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 skill or or something that they got over you that they do better learn from that you know and it it gives you the ability to 
to respect the other person at, at a new level. Mm. You know, that day that I read that quote, I went out on swing shift and the very, very first call was to the Greyhound bus station for a man down. And it was a, a drunk transient. Hmm. He was passed out. We woke him up, made sure he was okay. And then we we're going to take him over to detox and I'm got him handcuffed. I'm starting to search him before I put him in the backseat of my police car. And I hear the sound of water running. And I look down and urine's running down his leg, bouncing off his shoe, kind of like a fountain, and then into the gutter where we were standing right on the edge of the street. And I looked at him. I said, dude, do you know that you're being your pants? <laughs> and he looked at me. He smiled. And he goes, yeah. And this quote runs through my head. Every mm. man is better than me in some way. And that of him, I learned. I'm thinking, what's this guy got over me? Mm. And all of a sudden, it hit me. He's got survival skills. This is a man who doesn't want to go into a shelter. Who's mm. he, he, he doesn't want to obey the rules. And he's so dedicated to living life his way that he'll do whatever it takes. Mm. He'll do things I would never do. I wouldn't sleep out on the streets like that. I wouldn't be cold and miserable like that. But to him... Mm. That's the trade-off. Mm. So his survival skills, his his belief in living life his own way, he's got that over me. Mm. And what I did that day that was such a huge shift for me, Todd, and, and I hope somebody else listening to this can have that same shift. If you're looking down on other people, it gives you the ability, when you think about every man is better than me in some way, in that of him I learn, it gives you the ability to go, okay, this is this is another human being, and even though I don't agree with the way that they're living, I would never do this. They they got something going on that's good, mm. and and you know for them. Powerful, powerful, wow! Thank you for sharing that, guys. Carrie Mensure, follow him, uh, Carrie. Really deep conversation i thoroughly enjoyed that um i appreciate you and again thank you even though you once almost arrested me i say thank you (laughs) thanks for thanks for having so much impact in the world todd and you inspire me on a daily basis and i mean that Thank thank you wow oh wow i hope you all enjoyed today's episode you know in the beginning i talked about great cops And so many times now you hear about the bad cops. And like any profession, I don't care what profession it is, there are good people, there are bad people, and then there are great people. And Kerry Mansure, he represents the great ones, you know. And what he's committed to now with tomorrow's police officer, uh, what he's doing is grooming the next crop of of young men and women who are going to go into law enforcement. And one of the things I love that Kerry said in today's episode is that he's saved a lot more lives than he's taken. You think about the hundreds or thousands of lives that he's saved uh, when people were at their worst moments. One of the things I, I give so much credit to all the incredible law enforcement officers out there who are doing amazing things, the amount of lives they save because so many times they get a bad rap for the things when don't, things don't go well. Well, there's a lot of great things happening, and my hat's off to that. Also, he shared about the young gal whose life he's, he saved. The next day was her birthday. And he got emotional after the show actually talking about what I didn't share on the show was the next day was her birthday and that he and his comrade went to, to uh, Walmart uh, or, or Target and bought her several hundred dollars worth of gifts. That's because the heart and soul of that man is one where he wanted to serve the community. So my hat's off to Officer Mansur today and all that he shared and to all the men and women who serve valiantly today whether it be in the military, whether it be as a police officer, as a firefighter, uh, or as a first responder in in medical care today. There's so many people doing great things. And for that, I say thank you. And for that, I say continue to train hard. Continue to eat right. And don't forget to continue to live inspired and create impact.